Hi guys, just before we start the episode today, whatever platform you are listening to this on, whether it be on the podcast, uh, Apple podcast, YouTube, whatever it is, please support it. Please like, subscribe, whatever you can do. We want to reach as many people as possible. So please do that and we'll get right into the episode. Welcome to another episode of the Chronic Comeback Podcast. In this episode, I am really happy and excited to have on the show Dan Neufer. Uh, so Dan's story uh, with chronic fatigue sing- uh, syndrome and fibromyalgia uh, began with an abrupt onset uh, triggered by a, a vaccination. His symptoms range from extreme fatigue, bouts of fever and flu-like symptoms, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, as well as all-night sweats, uh, uh, allodynia, which actually I don't know what that is, so you'll need to explain that to me. Uh, pain and neurological symptoms such as fibro fog mm-hmm. and so much more. After fruitlessly uh, seeing dozens of doctors, uh, Dan took matters into his, uh, into his own hands and found his own pathway to recovery. He believes that the autonomic nervous system uh, dysregulation plays a fundamental role in chronic illnesses and that a a comprehensive treatment is critical. It is this approach that was key in in his own recovery, but then also in the countless others that Dan has helped through his own recovery program, ANS Rewire, which I'm excited to talk about. I've been excited for a long time to have uh, Dan on. I actually saw him on Raylan's show and I said to Brian, my podcast manager, was like, we need to get Dan on. And then um, actually it's been a lot of it. We could would have had him on a lot earlier if it wasn't for me and I kept rearranging stuff. So I want to, first of all, apologise to you, Dan, uh, but thank you so much for, for, for persevering and, and coming on. How, how are you? Uh, I'm good, thank you, uh, and that's no problem. It's my pleasure to come talk to you. Cool. Um, well, look, if we could go back uh, for your own story uh, before we talk mm. about the program itself, which I know people will be really excited to hear about. What was life like for you before you started to, you know, I mentioned like an abrupt onset of symptoms. Were you a healthy person before that? Um, what was life like before then? Yeah, look, um, I really always been a healthy person in my childhood um, I never really remembered any issues um, it was a very tumultuous period in my early 20s and I did actually experience a short period of illness for about three months which later on I recognized that may have been like a a run-up or like a <laughs> you know, uh, similar to CFS, CFS-like, mm-hmm. just didn't persist. Um, and, uh, but then I was, I was fully well. Um, and uh, yeah, and then things turned around quite suddenly. So uh, when you say it turned around quite suddenly, uh, what, at what age w- were you when that happened? And um, what happened? I, th- <laughs> I didn't write down my age. I reckon I was, I think I was about 29. Um, I was 29 or 30, yeah. and uh, I had um, uh, it was following the birth of my uh, my son, my firstborn. Oh. Um, my son, it was actually 18 months, about 18 months after he was born. Um, we had a pretty rough period uh, when my wife uh, went to give birth, uh, she nearly passed away. Um, she had to have uh, three uh, surgeries to try and save her life. Uh, I remember being in intensive care. I had to kind of say goodbye to her at one stage because they'd already done two surgeries. And I said, well, we don't know what else to do. Um, it was pretty stressful. I hadn't slept for something like two days. Uh, it wasn't, the care was a bit up and down. I remember at one stage trying to teach the, um, trying to teach the nurses in the intensive care how to correctly do the calculations to administer magnesium into her because her blood pressure was maxing out. So she went from having like, you know, some ridiculous blood pressure. Like I can't remember exactly, but it was something like 220 or 160 or something like this. And and then next moment, her blood pressure was virtually zero. Like they couldn't get a reading because she was bleeding. So, and she had a a condition called preeclampsia, which is very rare or HELP syndrome actually, which is an extreme version of it. And um, yeah, so I mean that was that was crazy. And in fact, um, when she finally pulled through, 
and uh, and I then went and picked up her sister, um, who had flown over from England, and uh, from the airport here in Sydney, uh, in, in in Brisbane, and I drove home, and I remember that was the first time in my life I ever had a migraine. It must have been like three days of no sleep or something like that, you know. And uh, but I was fine. I mean, I was wasn't fine. I mean, I, I ended up with PTSD. Um, there had been a whole bunch of other things that had happened, uh, which I won't go, go into. But it was all pretty ugly experience. Mm-hmm. And um, and I ended up with PTSD. Um, you know, where I was having uh, flashbacks during the day, walking like I was trying at work and. I'd go out at lunch and, and I'd have flashbacks of some of the things that had happened. And, you know, in the middle of the street, it's like in the movies, you know, how they show that where people, it really is like that. <laughs> well, at least it was like that for me. Uh, and, uh, but then I recovered from that. Um, life had kind of gotten back to normal. My wife was okay. My son was okay. And, um, I was probably about like, like maybe 14 or 15 months afterwards, I think. And uh, one of the uh, one of my colleagues, uh, her husband, uh, got chickenpox. And I'm like, I don't know if I had chickenpox. I don't know if I'm vaccinated for chickenpox. So I got the chickenpox vaccine. I was supposed to have two shots. Uh, I had the first shot, and uh, and very shortly afterwards, like within days. Uh, uh, I had an onset of, of CFS. Now, I just want to make clear this. I'm not saying that the vaccine vaccines cause CFS or the vaccine was bad or one shouldn't have vaccinations because I know it's a very controversial topic in the yeah. moment. Um, but a vaccine is supposed to be a stressor. It's designed to get your body to be in a, uh, to have a response. Yeah. And um, in, in my case, uh, for whatever reason, uh, probably combina- it's a combination of factors. I had an onset immediately afterwards of, of chronic fatigue syndrome. And I didn't, the strange thing was because I never even made the connection with the vaccine until like, I don't know, I don't know how many, five years, 10 years later, it was like, I never even thought about it. Mm. Which sounds strange because obviously I had the vaccination and then, you know, two or three days later, I'm like, I'm at work and we're going out for lunchtime and, and the guys are walking and I can't keep up with them. And they're like, what are you doing then? You know? And I'm like, um, I, I don't know. I, I, can't, I can't walk. And they're like, what do you mean you can't walk? Like, and I didn't know what to say because it didn't kind of compute in my head. I mean, how can you not walk, right? Like, mm-hmm. it seems like a stupid thing to say. And I'm like, oh. mm-hmm. I don't know. I was just confused, you know? And then uh, I was okay the next day. And then I went for a walk with, I remember distinctly going for a walk with my wife uh, and the baby in a pram and, and we crossed the lights and I got across the lights and I'm like, I, I, I can't keep walking. I, I, can't, I can't take another step. And she's looking at me like, <laughs> you're making fun, you know, like she didn't believe me. Like, I mean, not that why would I lie, but yeah, it just seemed like such a strange thing to say out of the blue, you know, like how weird is that? Right. And I'm like, no, I, I just can't do it. And she's like, oh, okay, then well, let's go. You know? And I'm like, I really can't do it. And, uh, yeah, that's how it started for me. It's interesting you say 29. And then the reason why I asked that, uh, that you, uh, what age you were at, because I, I see quite a bit of it. Having done so many of these interviews now, um, it's not, I guess it's not, you know, not the same for every single person, but there is quite a common thing. Uh, for me, it was like, it got extreme for me at 28. And it just, I don't mm. know whether it is, it's just the, you, you can get away with a lot of stuff in your 20s and it just gets to a point where your body's like, no, you haven't learned your lesson. I'm going to punish you now. Um, and it just seems that kind of transitional period from your 20s mm. to, into your 30s, there's something that happens there. Um, do, do, you, do, you see, do you see that? Is that a, like a pattern like of people that kind of age? I, I wouldn't say so, no. no. Um, I, I, but I can fully appreciate why you say that. Yeah, you know, and, and it's an interesting phenomenon. It's we call it confirmation bias in science, and there's a lot of this going on right now yeah. <laughs> in the world, yeah. Yeah. right? But we start to form a hypothesis, and then we notice things that support that hypothesis, and we see it everywhere. Yeah, it gets stronger and stronger, you know. And, uh, uh, and but I think there might be something to it. I mean, obviously, there is a lot more you can get away with in your twenties, and there comes a point where pushing that 
you know, where, where, where you may not be able to. So I'm not saying you're necessarily wrong, yeah. but um, I would say that I see onset at all ages. Yeah. At fair all right. ages. Um, yeah. And just going back into, to go back into your story then, you, obviously you're at that scary point where you didn't really know what was going on. Um, what were your, did you, were you kind of like immediately like housebound? You, know, you couldn't leave or was it just kind of up and down? Well, it was like, I got a bad flu. That's what it felt like. I'm like, okay, well, this is sort of, well, first it was the fatigue. There was that fatigue without any other symptoms, right? And that was just weird because like, I've never had that. Who, who would have that? You don't get that from the flu, right? You get it maybe after flu, but not beforehand, right? So first I just had that weird fatigue where I'm like, I, I can't walk. I'm like, what is going on? And then suddenly I started to, uh, I got a rash across my neck and across my chest which I never had a rash. And then I just got all the symptoms, you know, all the typical stuff, like a flu, you know, the feeling in the throat, headaches, fever, sweats, all of that. I thought, oh, okay, I must have gotten sick. So I you know, stayed home and tried to get better. And then, you know, it's the usual thing. You, you're at home for a while and then you go back to work. You think you're over it. You feel a bit washed out. And you go, oh, yeah, that'll be like that for a few days. And no, it didn't go and then suddenly got worse again hang on a sec what kind of a flu comes back like what what is that right and how come no one's catching it except me <laughs> so then i went to the doctor and the doctor uh, i remember he looked at my throat and he, he 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 flinched he was like oh my god your throat is so red like oh like like he literally flinched he goes, oh, that, how, how are you coping with the pain i go what pain i, I don't mean pain because your throat you know i, go, I don't have any pain in my throat because it's horrendous, you know. He goes, oh, you know. He says, I'll give you some antibiotics, and uh, and then he gave me also some painkillers, <laughs> which is funny because I told him three times that I didn't have any pain. Right? <laughs> Maybe that should have been my first lesson in my experience over the next ten years, but or seven years or whatever. And I went out and took those antibiotics. In fact, the rash actually came after the antibiotics. Now that I remember it, so I took the antibiotics and I took. I didn't take the painkillers because I didn't have the pain. And then I got the rash as well across my neck. And I thought, what on earth is this? And I don't know, that and the next kind of five and a half years kind of just melted into one mess. You know, it's funny. First, it's a day. God, oh, it's really bad. And then three days, wow. And then a week, whew, I'm over that. And then suddenly it's a month. And then it's two months. And then it's five months. And then it's kind of normal, right? Yeah. You know, after a few months, it's like nobody goes, oh, like, then you know you're in trouble, right? Because suddenly you haven't didn't get something. Suddenly you have something. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And then, I don't know, my, my journey probably sounds like most people's. Bounced around everywhere. Yeah, but, I mean, I just don't, I just remember when it first started, like, massively kicking off for me. Every day I'd wake up and think, oh, it's going to, it's going to go, it's going to get better soon. And because yeah. you're used to getting things, things getting better. And, uh, and exactly. Then, and then, yeah, I think you're right. When you've had it for so long, which is, you know, same the position I'm in and, and the position loads of other people are in, you, you can't almost remember not having it, um, which is, which is the scary bit that, you, you know, you just mentioned. Um, mm. So how were, how were you made to feel when you went to see doctors in this period? Were you made to feel like it wasn't really a th- an, an illness? We you, you know, how, how, how were you dealing with that? I think I back to that doctor afterwards, the one who kept prescribing me the pain medication. I saw another doctor and he was a really nice guy, actually young, young doctor. And, uh, you know, they tested me for everything and couldn't find anything wrong. And I said, wow, I'm just so sick. Like what, what, something's wrong, but what is it? You know? And he goes, uh, look, it's probably a virus. And he goes, you got to understand with viruses. We, we can't identify every virus that you can get. There's lots of viruses and we can't, test for everything he said so it's probably just some other virus that's a bit unusual and it'll just go away but it's funny how you know talking to you about it there and i don't talk about my own story so much these days you know but i, I i'm sort of recognizing that i actually held on to that belief for most of my illness uh i probably didn't realize a long time that it came from this doctor I thought I'd made that assertion myself, but it seemed like the natural consequence, right? I mean, you're, you're well, and then suddenly you get sick with something that's like a flu and it doesn't go away. You think you caught something, right? 
Mm. I mean, why would you suddenly be sick? There's got to be something wrong with you. Mm. So, yeah, that was kind of my experience. And, you know, first you sort of wait and then you keep going back and they're like, well, I can't do anything. So then you go to the next doctor and then the next and then the next. And then you go, then I started to go to other healthcare practitioners. And they t- often talk to me with a great deal of confidence. Oh, it's this or oh, it's this. And, and you go and you get all these treatments and yeah, and you get all excited. You're like, that could be it. And you just want it to be true, right? And, yeah. and oh my God, like, you know, I, I took all these treatments and didn't mm. eventuate to anything. And, you know, uh, the, the amount of money that I didn't have that I spent was ridiculous. And at the same time, you've got a young family, you're trying to stay afloat trying to keep your job. Uh, I had an understanding employers, but boy, it, it was a diff- very, very difficult time. Uh, it was just a case of when I was just going to work and then you'd come home and just just walk in literally, don't even take your shoes off or get changed, just straight on the couch. Mm. And that's it. That's, that's, that's all I remember. Uh, mm. You know, um, <laughs> yeah. I remember my son when he was three and four. That's all he'd see was me on the couch. All the pictures I have is with my son standing next to me at the couch. <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite true, <laughs> but you know, it felt that way, you know. And I do remember you asked that question about the doctors. I do remember um, later on, you know, sometimes I go to a doctor, maybe even for my son. I remember once I went for my son for something, and you have a conversation. I hadn't been going to a doctor for a while, and I almost put out, oh, yeah, like I have this, like I was trying to get a bite, you know, like, oh, I can help you, you know, or something like this. But instead, you just sort of get this non-response, like a silent response, or it almost felt like an internal roll of the eyes, you know, with some doctors, you know what I mean? I do. Um, with another doctor uh, I had, I remember she got all, she was like, oh, yeah, I've seen this many times. And I remember I was just so excited. Right? She goes, yeah, I've seen this. This is exactly what I've seen many times. We can fix this, no problem, blah, 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 blah. I'm sitting there, blah, blah, blah. I, remember, oh, I was so excited, you know, and this was probably like four years in or something. And she goes, yeah, it's allergies. And the moment she said it, I, I nearly burst into tears, right? I was just like, uh, 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 you know, I don't know what happened for the rest of the appointment, but I just remember walking out there feeling like someone had just smashed me over the head. Um, but you know, there's all doctors, all different doctors. I think many doctors just try and do their best. Yeah. You know, um, I had another doctor. I remember I have a lot of doctor stories, um, like most of us, right? <laughs> I remember another doctor I went in, and you know, he really, I could see he really believed me, and he was really trying to help me. And he was a normal doctor, not an integrative doctor, and he took so many tests. I don't know if I still have them somewhere, but I kid you not, it was this thick paper in tests and he was a normal doctor like normal gp this thick right and and he came back and obviously everything was normal except he said i had candida for you to know that someone has for for normal general practitioner to diagnose you with candida is pretty rare right (laughs) like that's something integrative doctors maybe do and and for him to do it based on a blood test is really rare, right? He said this stuff was rampant in me. So he put me on this like horse level of medication. He said, take this for six weeks and come back to me. And I was like, maximum dose. And I took it and I'm like, okay, finally I've got something. Like, you know, like yeah. really met, we've identified something with the test, right? Mm. And we're treating it. And I'm like, oh yeah, this is it. Six weeks I took this. I felt no different at all, but I thought maybe, maybe it's improved. Maybe it'll just take time, you know, went back and he got, did another test. Nothing had changed. (laughs) I was in the max dose of whatever. I can't remember what that medication is called. So, but you know, like I remember he didn't help me at all. Like I didn't help me get better, but to this day, I feel so warm towards that man. Yeah, you know, I, because I felt he really cared, you know. I, I know exactly what you mean. I I I had the exact same, not the exact same experience. And they did loads of tests. It was just after going to so many GPs who didn't want, who rolled their eyes, 
I had this one GP mm-hmm. who just really, really wanted to help me and it just felt nice to be heard. I mean, she didn't help me, but um, yeah. but yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. With, so with the Candida, you were just low, they just, he just, there's only, I guess it's such a st- systemic problem, isn't it? The only thing he knows to do is to load you with drugs because he hasn't been yeah. taught to do anything different. And it's just such a shame. No. Um, no. So no. At, at that at that point, you you were what like I guess you were saying like six years down the line, um, seeing like normal normal doctors. When did you start? Did you start to look down alternative routes then? Um, or when well, did that- I saw like some naturopaths. I saw some other healthcare practitioners. I saw a whole bunch of people. It didn't really eventuate in anything, right? And then there was actually a period. Now, I actually don't quite remember uh, how far in it was. If I had to guess, I'm thinking maybe it was two years in. I actually got better. (laughs) I'm not saying fully well, Mm. but I actually got, I don't know, I was kind of pretty functional. I was sort of managing at work and I was doing stuff. I was not bad, you know, maybe 85%. I hadn't done anything to achieve that. Like, I kind of had almost given up on treating and getting help. And I just, I don't know, I was just like trying to get on with my life. And somehow it got better in, in, inexplicably, I would say. But then, of course, it got worse again. And then what happened is uh, probably about uh, maybe five years in, I went to move house. Yeah. There was a lot of physical work involved in that, and I was in no shape at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I had no muscles. I had no muscles. Reminds me, leading up to the illness, I had been working very hard, by the way. It wasn't just a vaccine. I'd been working out as well Mm because I'm pudgy out a bit, and I got really into the gym. I was working very hard in the gym. I was working long hours at work. It wasn't just a vaccine. There was a lot of stuff going on around that time. But but anyway, yeah, I, I was in no shape at all. And But, you know, like we had to move out of the house. There's no flexibility there, right? Mm. And um, I remember I had to do like six or seven trips in a car. So, you know, you get the removal list to move the big stuff. And then you got all this stuff. I don't know, like loose stuff, you know, like lamps and boxes and, yeah and computers and all this. And I must have done like six trips and a lot, some of it was heavy and carrying it down the stairs. And I did it, you know, because it just had to be done. All right. And, and uh, I had a wife and I had two kids at that stage. Okay. And we got across to the other side. we moved in. And then in the, in the, shortly afterwards, I don't know how long, if it was weeks or a month or two, I crashed. And I mean, I crashed to new lows. And I was bed bound, like proper bed bound then. Um, so, I mean, obviously I had spent periods of time where you were bed bound, but that bed bound was like you're sick. You know, like when you got a really bad flu, you're bed bound. But are you bed bound? You can still get out if you really have to. You know what I mean? Mm. And here I was suddenly like I was wiped. I couldn't speak. I was just lying in bed. I couldn't move my arms. And I thought, um, I thought I'm gonna cock it. <laughs> yeah, I, I did. I thought I'm gonna cock it, and and that was rough. That was rough, and that was after I'd done that move, you know. So I went from this 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 Herculean effort to just get it done, and then I really paid the price for it. Yeah. Jeez. So, and, and and because because I, I want to get into your program and stuff, like I guess could you could you take us to the point where you know I. I I, I mentioned at the, the beginning, you know, you, you took control over your own recovery. At what point mm. did you get to, yeah, how did you get to that point? And what was it, how did you come across the, you know, the idea of the autonomic nervous system dysregulation in mm. that, that area? Mm. So look, what, what happened from there is uh, I, I was real sick. Uh, I remember for now my wife took me to the doctor because I couldn't go anymore. So she, it was different. I was like a passenger suddenly. I remember she took me to an integrative doctor and I sat there and, and she was trying to tell her what was going on because I couldn't speak anymore. And I'm sitting there in this chair. She looked at me and she goes, I've seen this. We can fix this. Don't worry, we'll get you good. 
And then, you know, it sounds like it'd be really positive words, but I started crying. A grown man, you know, I started crying. To me, that was, it sounded like it should be good, but I don't know. I don't know why. It seemed like poisonous words of false hope or something, or, or maybe it could be true, but if it was true, it'd be too good to be true. Whatever it was, I, I remember just crying there, you know, and then, and then I went, I, I, I was in, in, in bed and I got so bad, like I was saying before, that I literally couldn't get out of bed anymore. Couldn't move, couldn't do anything. And I was like that, I don't know for how long, it's all a blur. My wife and I have spoken about it since now. Like she said she tried to take me to the hospital and stuff and I apparently didn't want to go. I have no recollection of anything, right? I, I don't remember. And, but I remember that by, um, after a month or by however long that, that really severe period was, I, I crawled out of bed for uh, Christmas. And of course, I didn't help with anything like making food, two young kids, two and a six-year-old, you know, does Christmas get any more special, right? This is the times. And and uh, I couldn't even join them at the table to eat the Christmas dinner because I couldn't sit at the table. So I was on the lounge um, again, <laughs> but at least I was out of bed, right? And I remember sitting there, just lying there watching. And then we came to unwrap the presents. And I couldn't get my arms to unwrap the presents. I couldn't, you know how you just crack a smile and, Ah, with the kids, ah, it's exciting. And, you know, you're always going to do that for your kids, right, as dad. And I couldn't even fake the smile. I, I, trying to be happy, just trying to wrap the presents. And I was like, man, living with this illness as best as I could, because that had been my decision maybe a year earlier. Just you can't fix it. No one can help you. No one knows anything. Just just live with it, man. You know, like make try and make the best of it, you know. And I suddenly went, that, that doesn't work. That's not going to work. <laughs> Yeah. So I didn't do anything then because I was still too wiped out and I went back in bed and I think it, it must have been, it was in early January. So like, what's that? Two, two weeks later or something like that. I, I managed to crawl out of bed again and, um, and I, I, I crawled my way into the study and I sat there and looked out through the curtains in the blue light because, you know, it's, it's middle of summer here. And I've, I just had this thought, Dan, you work it out. Yeah, you know, which seemed preposterous, right? And I uh, went out and I told my wife, and she said, "Yeah, Dan, I, I think you will." And I was like, "Oh crap! What if I just done?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's one thing saying something stupid and ridiculous to yourself, you know, in those moments of grandeur where you try and bolster and you say something that is not really possible in your mind, but then when you say it out loud, and then someone says you will, then you're suddenly backed in a corner, and and that kind of went through the motions, you know. I went to the motions of trying to work out what's going on, but I got no background in biochemistry. I got no background in medicine. I'm not a, I'm not a doctor. Uh, my background was in, in physics. That's why I did my scientific training. And then I worked in a, I moved out of that into the, the financial services industry as a number cruncher. So, you know, I, 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 could, I couldn't even read anything. I, I'd gone read medical papers and I'm like, I don't even know what the words meant. Yeah. And then plus you got all the brain fog and right. you got no energy. I mean, it was like, I'm like, who am I kidding? But desperation is a powerful force, you know? And so what I did is I just kept looking and I didn't want to treat anymore. You know, there's all these books out there and, you know, ideas, treat this, and, you know, your adrenals, your thyroid, your this, your energy, your mitochondria, your gut, your candida, your, I can talk about, you can talk about this for hours, right? We all know, have heard this stuff. I'm like, yeah, but why is it all like that? Like, you know, how come my beer swilling, pizza eating friends, they, they're not sick. Like, why am I so sick? There must be a reason, right? Which I still thought was a virus. And, um, and so I, I'd seen that movie, um, Lorenzo's Oil, you know, where the parents try and work out this cure for their kid and they wanted to find out themselves and work with these biologists and work it out themselves. And I was kind of inspired by that. And I thought, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And, and I looked at it and I went like, you know, how does energy work in the body? How, how is it created? Why would you not be able to have energy? Yeah. Why would I have these weird things going? I looked at all the symptoms and how is that created? Yeah. And then I always kept going, why? And I came up with all different ideas and theories. 
uh, at one stage I was uh, convinced that it was a um, like an enzyme deficiency. I thought it was a uh, uh, what was it? Uh, 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 aldehyde dehydrogenase deficiency or something like that. You know, uh, because I could see that you know if I drank some alcohol, I was like completely messed up. Like I'd have like half a beer, and it's like I'd have to hang over from you know, the worst hangover in your life. And I be in bed for a week from half a beer. All my German friends would make fun of me, right? They go, ah, what's wrong with you? Yeah, just drink a beer, you know? I'm like, I can't, you know? And so I'm like, I thought maybe that's it, you know? But but of course, that didn't explain all the symptoms. So the more deeply I dug, uh, you know, like I got magnesium deficiencies. Well, why do people have that? What determines your level of magnesium in your body? Why would you have low magnesium, right? And I'd look at it. I keep going deep, 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 deep. I want to find out why, why, why. And it always led to a dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. So no matter what symptom I looked at, it led to that. And to be honest, at that stage, I hadn't given CFS and fibromyalgia and POTS a whole, a whole lot of um, credence. Like when doctors had spoken to me about this, I just kind of, I don't want to say rolled my eyes, but I was like, I've got a real illness, man. I, I don't know what this fatigue syndrome is, but like, I think I got virus. There was, I was healthy. Now <laughs> something wrong with me. Now, this was my thinking. I, I hadn't mixed with anyone else who had the illness. Mm. The, the internet, I don't know, maybe the internet was busy back then or not. I, I didn't look at that. I didn't, I didn't really look at it. You know, it was only when, when I went on this research that I really actually kind of accepted the fact that these diagnoses were real, what I had, as opposed to just some virus. And I'd actually seen uh, a story of someone who published their symptoms in their journey. He wrote this big, big blog post. It was like massive. I remember it was like three o'clock in the morning, you know, when you can't sleep and you're looking for desperate answers. And I found this blog post and it, it was like 10, 15 pages long, right? And my God, it was like, this is like me. This is like all the symptoms he had, you know? And I think that was what kind of convinced me that it wasn't some weird infection that I had, that it was this chronic fatigue syndrome, which is what several doctors had spoken to me about, yeah. But, but um, once you, once you, because I guess the confusing thing about like CFS and, and a lot of other chronic health issues is that you hear of these other recovery stories of people getting better through diet alone or you know very specific mm. things so then you're just chasing this shiny object constantly oh they recovered because of that and then i go after that and and i i actually only really heard of given that i've had this for so long i only heard of brain retraining about two years ago um and mm. even then you don't immediately do it because you're questioning that that sounds weird so it takes me about a year to actually believe that 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 can happen um were you were you not kind of did you not have that now you had the cfs like label or like in your mind were you not chasing stuff like diet and all of that kind of stuff or or was it had you kind of got it honed down on this um autonomic nervous system dis dysfunction well i tried all that stuff during the years you okay. know like when you go to the naturopath or yeah. with this person or that person they tell you this and i tried all kinds of diet i've done all that stuff i tried all the supplements yeah you know i it's oh my god yeah. Like, so how much did I try? You know, I tried all that. I, I, I was almost militant and it, it, it got such a reaction on me. I did not want to know about any more treatments because I was like, why would I need to treat this? Why have I got candida? Why don't other people have candida? Why, why is this? Why wouldn't it work with me with the medicine? Like, I was like, I felt very angry, mm. very angry and very jaded. And people tell you like, oh, it's this and it's that. And I'm like, well, where's the proof? Show me that this 100% works. Who does this not work? Why would it not work with everyone? You know, I, 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 I was sick of all that stuff. I was sick of treating all these symptoms. I mean, I've been doing that for years. It never worked. Mm. And I'm like, well, if this is the answer, why isn't everyone doing this? So I kind of didn't, I, I did not want to treat any symptoms. I just wanted to find the cause. Yeah. I 
And so, so what did you do then? Like, how did you, obviously you've got your program now and you must have got that knowledge from somewhere. Like, did you, did you do a course yourself or was it kind of self-taught? No. So first I uh, came, everything led me to the autonomic nervous system, bang, autonomic nervous system all the time. So I'm like, okay. And I got to a point where I felt super confident that that is what's wrong. Now, mind you, I hadn't actually come across anyone who would recover. I mean, I, I'd heard naturopaths and different people tell me that they cured all these people with all these different treatments, but they never worked for me, right? So I was, I'm like, I had something different. You know what I mean? And then even then, when I had accepted the CFS fibro and, and, and I mean, how can you not accept fibro and POTS diagnosis? But anyway, even then when I'd accepted, I hadn't actually heard of anyone who'd recovered per se. I, I hadn't connected with anyone. I, I never even knew a single person who'd had this illness. Mm. Never spoke with one, never saw someone on the internet until a blog post, right? I know you're thinking, what's wrong with this guy? But that was kind of in my own world. I was like... I don't know. I mean, this is a long time ago. This is like 20 years ago. Maybe not everyone was on the internet the same way in forums or whatever. I'm sure there were many people, but but because I never connected to the diagnosis, do you know what I mean? I, yeah. I thought, so I didn't look at it. But when I went done my research, I still hadn't heard of anyone recover. But what I when I looked at it, I thought, okay, well, if this is something that happened in the brain and it caused the brain to, and, and what once I once it became uh, once I connected with this uh, hypothesis, let's say, it became really more obvious to me because I started to realize how strange my brain was. You know, like I started to notice how strangely I behaved with my kids. Like when I brushed their teeth, it was like, I'm uh, like, I'm diffusing a bomb, you know, like I'm, instead of just brushing their teeth, I'm like, uh, you know, like this. And I go, what the, what is that? That's just really strange. So then that really reinforced this idea that there's something wrong with the brain. And of course I go, well, uh, yeah, I've got the brain fog and I've got the sensitivity to the lights and I get this weird smell sensations. And of course, it, 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 you know, once you find something out, it becomes really obvious. You know what I mean? Go, of course, it must be the brain. But then I thought, okay, well, theoretically, if the brain does that, well, why can't it do the other thing? I thought it, it must be possible or it might be possible. And then, so what did I do? I... I thought, well, the brain is clearly reacting, like hyper-reacting. And I thought, so I have to teach it not to hyper-react. Mm. And so I started uh, with meditation training. Yeah. I started with meditation training. And at the same point, I actually, which seemed like a very strange thing for me to do, I actually went back to find myself another doctor. <laughs> At the time, it's really bizarre because, you know, I had not had a good experience, but I was like, just when I realized how it all worked, I thought, you know, you can't treat the brain in isolation. Like, obviously, why did this happen in the first place? Yeah, there's obviously something very wrong with my body. And I'm like, the stuff that's happening in my body is affecting my brain. And the stuff that's affecting my brain in my brain, that's wrong in my brain, is affecting my body. So I'm like, okay, I've got to work on both sides. So I went and I connected with the doctor, and he really drilled into me about diet and things like that. And I had a lot of resistance to it. But I was like, okay, all right. I did that. And we did some supplements to support the gut and some stuff to support energy. We did all that. And none of it did like anything magic. Right. But I did the brain. I started doing brain training. I did meditation. And then I started to change how my nervous system and my body and my mind, how all of it was responding to triggers, to stressors. Mm. So I sought to change how I brush my children's teeth, how I'm breathing, how I'm using my body, and start to become aware of these physiological abnormalities in my mind and my body in the presence of doing everything. And that was a real eye opener because I'm like, my goodness, I've become a weirdo. <laughs> like, this is normal, man. Like, this is not normal, right? Like, and you know, you don't notice it when it happens over this period of time. 
Yeah. You, you know, because it's a gradual change. And then suddenly as I became cognizant of all this, I was like, whoa, what, what am I doing? So I started to train myself not to do all these things. And I started to try and do some physical activity. And I slowly I got better. And I think it was maybe six, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to remember the, the time frames exactly because it took me some time to work the stuff out, to come to the hypothesis. And then I worked with the doctor a bit. And then I started to really get into the brain training. And uh, I remember one stage I started to do some yoga. And I went to like an old ladies yoga class. Old ladies, literally, like one lady was in her wheelchair. So yeah. I did that. <laughs> yeah, I'm like a dude in his like mid 30s in there with all these ladies in the 60s, 70s, and 80s coming in in a wheelchair, right? And I remember I'd, I'd go, oh yeah, I'm doing better. I can do this, you know, gentle yoga class for like 30, 40 minutes. I remember one time, and I'm thinking, I'm getting better. This idea, this hypothesis is true. Look at me, I'm doing this. And, you know, I'm kind of more funny. I won't say I'm out of bed, right? I'm no longer bed bound. I'm like, you know, I'm not well, but I'm sort of, uh, if I'm better, I'm just going in the right direction. I'm getting hope up, you know, because hope was a very ugly double-edged sword for me. Yeah. And I went to this yoga class and uh, and it started off. And the first minute, the first thing you do is like um, warrior pose, right? And the lady in a wheelchair is like this, you know, and I, I go like this and I'm like, I couldn't do it. Man, I couldn't do it. Like, it, this is first minute of the course. And I go, I put my arms, uh, uh, I couldn't do it. And I'm like, okay, of course I can do it. You know, I didn't want to believe that. And there's almost like a panic inside, right? Because you're going, hang on a sec, I thought I was recovering and now I can't hold my arm up for one minute with old ladies. Mm. And and I'm, I, I'm trying to make it happen. I'm trying to make it happen. It came to this point that, I don't know, seemed like an attorney. It was probably a minute or two minutes into the class where I realized I can't fake it. I can't muscle through it. I cannot hold my arms up like this. And I had to quit the class and say, basically, I'm not well enough to keep up with the old ladies in the first minute of the class. And that Phil was probably the lowest point in my whole CFS journey, lower than when I was bedbound, when I thought I was going to die. Right? Yeah. You know, when I was bedbound and I had the pot syndromes and my heart was laboring, that that was scary. But I was so out of it. But this this was the worst because I'd finally, after all these years, allowed a glimmer of hope in my mind, and now I'm going clearly, I am delusional. Right? Oh, yes, I've worked out the theory and explanation for the illness, right? And oh, I'm getting better with all this. And I'm like, this is rubbish. You're lying to yourself, right? Here's the proof you can't hold the arms up with old ladies. It's like you can't deny the fact. Yeah. That's like a really harsh measure. And I went home and my wife was at work. She was kind of supporting us at this stage because I, I couldn't work. And, uh, yeah, that, I, I broke down. I called Lifeline that day. That was ugly. Wow. That was an ugly day. But then somehow, you know, two days later, I sort of looked at it and go, well, hang on a sec, you know. Okay, I couldn't do that, but I managed to go to the class. That wasn't so long ago. I would never even be able to drive the car. So, you know. Clearly, I had made some progress. It's really hard to not lose your mind somewhere in the process of chronic illness, you know? Yeah. And I just looked at that and thought, okay, just keep going. Yeah, and it was about 18 months later where I thought, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm recovered. And I, I must admit to you, even at that stage, I struggled to think of myself as a well person. I remember it was, a, again, you know, nice sunny day. And I was running down the road. I started running. I'd never been a runner. I'm still not a runner, to be honest. I don't really like it. But I was doing it because I could. It was kind of novel, you know, like yeah. when you have like chronic fatigue syndrome and fibro and parts of whatever for like, you know, seven years nearly. And then you can go running. You do it just because you can, right? And I started been running for, I don't know, maybe months or so. And 
And I hadn't had symptoms probably in about three months, maybe longer. I don't remember exactly. And I'm running down the road and I'm going, imagine myself being a well person. I was a well person, right? I mean, I'm running. I haven't had any symptoms in months. Like how much, well, well, that's well, right? But the weird thing was I couldn't imagine myself being a well person even in that moment of doing that. Wow. And I thought, wow, this illness really screws with your mind, you know? Yes. The, so, yeah. It, it, the, the, the trauma that you'd had uh, and the belief, I guess it's, it, it's amazing that you were able to get rid of all your symptoms while still having that belief in your mind. <laughs> I'm kind of speechless, right? Yeah. 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 You're right. I mean, like, I teach mind body medicine. I tell people how important it, you know, I wrap it on. I wrote the book, See If It's Unraveled, because I felt the most important thing was to understand so that you act and follow through. You've got yeah. to persist with this. Yes. Yeah. And if you don't believe it, why would you persist? Yeah. And if you don't believe it, it's very difficult to do some of the uh, mind body exercises. You've got to believe it. Right. Yeah. But having said that, I didn't believe it. I never thought I honestly, I was bro I'm broken. Like I, so deeply knowledge not belief knowledge that i'm broken that that's how i looked at it so but i still recovered do you do you think uh because I, I i that resonates with me so much and it must resonate with everyone who's listening that we all have this uh, on an intellectual level i understand everything that i'm being told um but there's just this yeah this deep down belief that that I've cultivated over the years that I'm different and that there's something <laughs> broken about me. Um, and I know I'm really building that back up now and, I, and I'm so much better than I was, but it's still there. It still definitely is. And it's that neural pathway that's still kind of firing. Um, and is that, would you say that's one of the biggest uh, limiters in, in limitations with people that you see in, in their recovery? I think it can be. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I see that all the time. Uh, it it leads to behaviors and, and and that are not what you plan to do. Yeah. I mean, you go. What does your beliefs have to do with physical uh, treatment for a health condition? Well, you know, I try and explain to people. I go, if you have a heart condition, and your doctor says in three years you'll be dead unless you take this pill, and this pill works in one hundred percent of the people, and will one hundred percent ensure that you have a normal lifespan. Well, if you don't believe in it, it doesn't work. Yeah. And the reason is, if it's sitting in your cupboard there above your, your sink, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't magically go through the glass, through the ether, into your body. Like yeah. it only works if you actually take the darn pill out of the box, put it in your mouth and swallow it. Yeah. And that is determined by your belief that the pill is going to work. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I remember it was like something like, I don't know how many years, maybe five, five years probably after I had recovered that I did this exorcism of getting rid of all the pills, right? And I literally, I have a big dining table. It's enough for eight people, yeah? The whole table was covered in supplements and medications. And that was probably, that, that was probably only half of what I'd had. Like yeah. some of it had been thrown away over the years. And I'm like, most of it was unused. Yeah. Like I'd buy it, I'd take it for a while and go, oh, this isn't working. What am I doing this stuff for? Yeah. Like I'm not feeling any different. And then I'd stop. <laughs> yeah. God. Don't follow through, man. Yeah. And, we, don't, and we don't follow through. We don't follow through if we don't believe it. I, I, something I read, uh, which I alluded to at the beginning, was treatments that you tried before that didn't work now start to have an impact. Is, is that, is that right? Mm, well, maybe the anecdote about the candida is a good I I indicator. So what did I then do? Did I do a treatment? Well, I changed my diet. I did take some things to help my gut heal. And eventually my poo stopped looking orange, started to turn brown. <laughs> That's a good sign. <laughs> That's a good sign. Um, you know, yeah, it's like in ANS Rewired, you know, people will say, oh, what about this thing? Oh, what about this? I have this thing. Will this work? What do I do about this? I'm like, I don't know. 
I know. I, I don't know how you get rid of symptoms. Like all these symptoms that we have, we can't get rid of them. You, you go and get treated for them. Sometimes we have some success with some symptoms, but often we don't. And frankly, trying to get rid of symptoms is very difficult. Wow. Uh, what you can get rid of is what's causing the symptoms. Yeah. Now, once you start to have a plan that takes into recognition why this is all happening, and you have a multilateral plan that includes reducing the physiological, the neurological, and the psychological stressors on your body-mind instrument, if you like, yes? Once you really take that pressure off the nervous system, your body can move towards a more normal functioning and it will heal on its own because that's what it's supposed to do, right? And when you move towards that state, as opposed to this dysfunctional state where no matter what treatment seemingly we do, nothing works, right? Then the treatments that often have done nothing in the past will suddenly be like miracle treatments. Mm. Because why wouldn't they work? Like you go to, do you think all these people are lying to us? They go, oh, I've seen people with this oh, hundreds of times. Yeah, you just need to take this. This works. This works every time. I have so many people who told me that. Never worked, right? And that's most of our experience. Mm. But those people weren't lying. They just had normal healthy people who had a problems like we did in our body. And when they treated them, they got better. Yeah. Once we become more functioning in, in our nervous system and allow the body to start to build up uh, its functioning and not be so dysfunctional, then all these wonderful treatments can, can often start to help. Yeah. I have so many people who I can't take any supplements. I can't do this. I can't do that. Or I tried that. It made me worse. And then I tried again once they start to make progress with their recovery. And wow, suddenly helps. Do you believe that people can, so because I'm someone who is purely physical, all I was doing was, you know, just I, I, so many, I mean, we have very different symptoms, but so many uh, things that are just the same. I just constantly just focus on treatments, physical treatments, give me something to take whatever is in me out of me. In fact, viruses was one of the first things that, that people were talking about. And it took me a long time to realize that okay there's something going on you know with the mind body and and that side of things and now i'm kind of at the point where i'm like actually could i just if i just didn't focus on the physical stuff at the moment and just focused on the uh you know the the limbic system dis dysregulation that side of things then would my body be in a position where it could just react normally and do all the things it's meant to do naturally and it might take me a bit longer but i don't have to do all of the, the supplements and stuff like that is there a, is is there truth in that or do you feel like you've always got to be doing the physical stuff as well you know phil i guess what i would say to you is this first of all there's all these experts right and people come to me i've got now neurologists and doctors and naturopaths and psychologists from all over the world coming to me, right? Because of the amount of experience I have with this. And I'm like, I'm like treated like the expert now. And I'm like, you know, the funny thing about experts is they, they get their idea and they get their model of the world and then they tell you that's how it is. Mm. And I'm like, okay, well, where's the scientific evidence that that is exactly how it is, mm. right? And we don't have much scientific evidence around this illness because people are generally not that interested in researching this, which is not a different problem. But the point is this. People have varying experiences, right? And so I would say be mindful about listening to some expert about this is how it is or that's how it is. There's one true expert, and that is you. Mm. you got to do what works for you and what we got to look at the evidence. And by evidence, I mean outcomes, results, mm. right? And if it's not working, we always say, okay, am I doing it right? Am I doing it well enough? Am I doing it too, too well? Mm. Do I need to do something else? Yeah, right? And we need to then adjust our approach, yeah? So what I can tell you is um, there have been people who tried all this mind-body stuff and they didn't get anywhere. Because the word mind-body in relation to this illness is a little bit, uh, you know, mind-body kind of insinuates there's a problem with the mind. Mm. 
This is not a mind problem. This is a neurological disease. People don't go to Parkinson's people or Alzheimer's go, oh, well, you know, let's mind body medicine, right? Like it's a neurological illness. It's just that the, the, the only reason we use the mind because it's a way to affect the nervous system. But in the ANS Rewire program, we also talk about doing physical things to affect the nervous system, right? There's universities around the world who use physical devices to train the brain to change how it reacts because this is a neurological illness. Yeah. So, you know, to think of just psychological techniques is very narrow minded. So it's not a mind body approach. It's a neurological approach. Yeah. And what I would say is we do whatever works. How many, if, if you were to ask me uh, the question slightly different, say, then how many people have you come who've treated all the symptoms and then they got well and just did that? I would say probably none in all my years of experience. And even the ones who think they did this treatment or they did that treatment, and I've heard it all, right? When you actually listen to the interviews I've done with them, listen carefully and watch the questions I ask them, you'll realize they're actually engaged in a range of other strategies, including what some people would call mind, body, or brain training strategies. It just sometimes they didn't realize. Yeah. If you then were to say, what about people who only do the mind body? Does that work? And I will say, yes, I've come across numerous people who've done that. Numerous people. Mm. But I can also tell you, I've come across numerous people who tried that and then they struggled somewhat. And when they started to add some physical strategies to complement it, they had their breakthrough. Now, most people who teach you mind body strategies don't like this, what I'm saying. Mm. Because it's conflicting right? Uh, these kind of strategies don't work well together. It, it, it's difficult to do some of these mind-body strategies and do physical strategies at the same time uh, because of the way they work. Uh, and you're probably getting some insight if you're doing some mind-body work yourself, how going to a naturopath and chase, finding out if you've got some infection and how that doesn't really work in, in the light of what you're doing. Yeah. And so we have to find a balancing act, right? But what I would say is that, hey, if you're only doing mind-body work and it works, fantastic. And I've seen that happen many times. Mm. If you get stuck, then either look at uh, deepening your understanding of what affects the nervous system, right? And why some people recover with diet or this or that physical treatments, supposedly. Um, and by understanding that, you can incorporate more strategies. Or it may also be that something more needs to be done even on the psychological side. So if it's not just the physical, but also the psychological, because both are equally important, they both feed into the nervous system. Mm -hmm. right? So it's a nervous system dysfunction. It doesn't matter whether it's physical or uh, psychological that is triggering the nervous system. Yeah. And, and so sometimes that needs to be un unraveled. Yeah? Uh, and some people might, like, might have PTSD. Now, my PTSD... I would say for all intents and purposes had really resolved by the time I got ill, <laughs> mm. right? That's not the case for most people. Most people are in the full flight of their PTSD when they get this, right? People with a PTS history. So I, I hope that answers your question. I hope that's not too wishy-washy. No, no, it, it does. Um, Dan, this is a, this is a first, like I've, we're basically running out of time and I've got so many questions I, I, I want to ask you. We're pretty much run out of time. I was just wondering whether, because I feel like we've, I feel it's super important that everyone heard your recovery story just because I think it's one, it's really inspiring. And two, it just shows like all the different areas and, you know, people have to go through, but I just think the, the whole brain retraining side of things, I've got so many questions. Would you be open to maybe coming back on it for a second time and we could just talk a lot more about that in detail with, with that would you be open to that sure sure i'd be happy to to explore that in a little bit more detail brilliant and i really appreciate that just because uh i would just wouldn't want to rush that part because i think it was difficult i didn't want to take take away from either parts of it um i guess so just to i get to go back into your story because we've now got this other opportunity to talk about the the program um uh, and, and and ending it on a positive note like what advice would you give to people right now? You know, you mentioned you're at your lowest, uh, at your lowest 
uh, time you it was when you were you know you'd gone to that yoga class and and you know mm. it, it, you, the hope had just been drained out of you there are so many people in that situation right now listening to this what would be your advice to them in order for them to just keep going and keep trying let me tell you this People's opinions are all lovely. Everyone's got their opinion. They try and fluff you up with a positive story. And like you say, we all feel like we're different and we're broken. Let me show you this. And this is not, I probably wouldn't have been able to talk to you like this if you, when you asked me at the beginning of my 10-year journey after this illness, right? Mm. When I didn't know anyone, because I didn't know anyone, right? <laughs> it was just me. Um, I only met people when, when I started to write the book. Um, I have met people where I can tell you they shouldn't be able to recover. From a physiological point of view, it's just there's too much stacked against them on the psychological and physiological side of things. Right? And I could have made a very strong scientific argument. Right? There are good reasons why not everyone recovers and these people can't recover and blah, 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 blah people who had such severe illness, uh, secondary illness, right? Um, and they proved me wrong. Hmm. Now, I didn't say to them, oh, you can't recover, yeah. right? But they proved me wrong. People with such severe mental illness, like how can they do brain training? Like, 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 like things like schizophrenia. People who are in domestic abuse situations. I had one lady that I spoke to last year in my program. She was homeless during a pandemic. All right? She had been gone from 10% to 70% functioning when I spoke to her. 70%, 50%, actually, I can't remember if it was 50 or 70%, but she was like from really low to like doing pretty darn well. Right. And this was a little short time later. And I had two questions for her. I was like, one, how do you even get access to my program and do it? <laughs> it's online when you're homeless. <laughs> and two, where do you find any kind of money? I mean, of course, my aim is to make the program pretty cheap. Right. But yeah. nonetheless, for a homeless person, <laughs> this is work. Yeah. And she said she was homeless, but she was in a car. She had a laptop an old laptop and a friend bought the program for her oh and that's how she did it. Right. And there she was again, living in the house with people because she'd recovered and getting her life back together. So I'm like, don't let anyone, don't let any expert tell you what you can and can't do. Right. You're the expert in your life. You're the expert in your recovery. And if someone does, if something doesn't work for you, right. Then find something else. It doesn't necessarily mean it's all wrong what you did just means you have to maybe do it slightly differently it's not what you do it is how you do it mm. half the time right whenever i would go to coach people who are even in my program it's like that they're, they're doing it but are they doing it they're not doing it in a way that works they're not doing it in a way that reduces stress they're doing it in a way that increases stress right mm. i'm like that's why you haven't had progress okay bang right and so so that's why people who've tried other programs come to my program and then they have to success. Yeah, sometimes it's physical strategies. Sometimes it's just hearing it from another person. And guess what? It goes the other way. I've had people in my program go, so didn't have any success. They were stuck. And then they went off and did another program. And I'm like, it told them the same thing. Just a small version of what's in my program. It just told them the same. But they heard it in a different way. Yeah? And it made sense to them. And they were able to do it. So. Go with the mentor that you like. Go with the teacher that you like. Follow your instinct and don't give up. Don't let anyone tell you that you cannot recover, right? Because, because there is just no scientific evidence that you can't do it. And that's, that's awesome, man. I mean, God, if anyone, if anyone can inspire us, is that woman in her car, homeless, uh, with a laptop, getting better that's that's incredible Man. um you know it's the most amazing part of my job phil right yeah. i get to speak to these amazing people from all over the world like a lot of really amazing people like uh, people like 
you know, that make a name for themselves in the world, right? And but I mean, meet these amazing, inspirational people, like who who just do stuff, like the way they overcome like abuse situations or trauma. Mm -hmm. They go off and they do it, and I, I, I coach them. I come off, and I'm like, wow, I'm so inspired. I'm like, I'm so privileged. It is amazing these people, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, gee, I, I never realized just how amazing people are. And the thing is, here's the thing, here's the kicker, Phil. I know whoever's listening to this. I know what's going on in their head, right? I've, I, I, I know what it's like on the other side, right? We think it's the other people. You know, there's these amazing people that they can do it. They're super strong and resilient and smart. And ah, we think it's them, but it's not us, right? We never think it's us. And I can tell you that is what makes the people amazing. It's just, just the hell, they hang on to the belief and they, they just seek the answers. Mm. When there are no answers, the answers don't work. They keep going and they do it in a loving, gentle way with themselves. And that's what may, turns them into those amazing people. Yeah. They're no different than you and me and the rest of us. Yeah. Right. They're no different. So, what makes us amazing is is us persisting. Yeah, definitely. It's in all of us. It's in all of us. Couldn't agree more. Um, th th thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. Uh, I'm really happy and excited you've uh, agreed to come on again. Uh, we'll have to book that in. And I know people really want to hear about all the science and everything behind it. That'd be amazing. And um, if people want to connect with you, uh, just uh, ask you any questions about what's come up today. How, how is it, How would they best go and do that? Well, look, I mean, uh, depends what they want to find out. Um, uh, my website is uh, cfsunraveled.com. That's where I've done all my advocacy work, which started way before the program. Mm -hmm. The program is ANS for autonomic nervous system, rewire.com. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm on all the media outlets under the CFS Unravel term or try and search Dan Neufer. Um, the best way, if people want to find out more about my explanation, is probably to read the book. Yeah, okay. It's a very low-cost way of getting learning about it. I, I also have a lot of free videos, but the book will help you get, get your head around it. If it's too tech for you, then just take the main message. I have also for the program, there's four free intro lessons. Okay. Um, I really strongly urge anyone to watch those before they enroll. If it doesn't resonate with you, don't enroll in the program. Mm. Um, if you don't feel you can commit to what's in there, don't enroll in the program, find something else. Mm. But um, in any case, whether you enroll in the program or not, it, it gives you more of an explanation of how you as an individual got sick and have all these symptoms. And it should help people it tends to help people just to feel more at ease with their situation so that they can focus on doing something productive. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So uh, I, I reckon uh, looking at those four intro lessons for main SBY is, is a great way to, to move forward. Brilliant. Cool. Look, thank you so much for, for coming on and, uh, and sharing your story. I know you said you don't normally do that. So uh, hopefully it was okay for you and uh, yeah, really excited to have you back on. Thank you, Phil. Uh, it was my pleasure and I look forward to talking to you again.